Hey everybody, I'm Tyler Arlena. I'm back with another episode of the Brush Sauce Theater. I have a special guest, Colton Duell here, and he's going to be showing us how he creates kind of complex interiors for game design. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, yeah, it's certainly a pleasure. So you have all your work up here. This is where everybody can find you on your art station. Everything looks really great. And basically, you, from what I gather, you have a number of approaches that you use to tackle different types of scene design. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, uh, my approach really varies so much. I'll make, I'll make every image almost a completely different way, um, mostly because I get bored and I like finding new workflows and stuff. Mm -hmm. So wh why don't you highlight a few different methods that you've used throughout your gallery to get us started? Okay. So I can go back. Um, so some of my older work, I would say this one, I built in completely in ZBrush. I, I barely did any drawing on this one at all. Keyshot, which is a rendering software, has a has a function called Tune Shader, and it basically detects the edges of your model and puts a line there. That's awesome. So I used that a lot back when I was in FZD because um, my drawing wasn't good enough, and I needed to get work like upon graduation. Mm -hmm. So I messaged some people, and they were just like, Build some really sick 3D models, use Toon Shader, and make some decent presentation. And so I, I did that a lot. They do uh, help with, with certainly different design uh, elements and presentation. Like, I think those two uh, shots that you were showing me earlier with the triangular based structures and those generators next to it, that's the same technique you did, right? Yep. Exactly the same with this one. And I mean, I did do a little bit of drawing, like, mm -hmm. dot, like, dirt on the ground scratches i went in and put a wash underneath so it so it reads against the background um same with this one here exact same technique so yeah um, that's I a very that's awesome, awesome presentation stuff. though by the way like that would take probably a fairly solid amount of time to, to draw that all by hand uh yeah it would it would take a long time and i mean we did that this is one that i did draw completely by hand like just because i built it a certain way doesn't mean that like you don't need to learn how to draw because it's yeah. essential. It's one. Yeah, I feel like if you haven't got your hands dirty trying to draw and you're you're you you will have a less of an understanding of knowing like what's a good drawing versus what's a bad drawing, for example. Yep. Yeah, and another cool thing is you see this triangular building right here. I actually took this building and made it the triangle and stuff inside of this, and mm -hmm. then I just built some extra parts on it and turned it into something completely different so that's another thing you can do with 3d you can make your own kit bash set basically yeah and that that's a very efficient way for t saving time and uh you know getting a job done yep so what that's else is in your uh technique uh that is that goes beyond uh zbrush you said you had some uh, hand painted ones yeah so uh i think a lot of people's favorite is is this one this one's completely painted by hand um no 3d underlay no anything just hit by hand painted so it's um, like you you weren't you weren't trained and and entirely like brought up with the cheats <laughs> and, and these shortcut no. methods like you you've put your time in nailing down your your kind of raw fundamentals oh yeah i've been through the whole viscom aka you know scott robertson's draw through how mm -hmm. to draw book that kind of stuff um, I went, I went through all that, uh, in FZD, they made us grind it. Uh, I was practicing it a little bit before FZD. So yeah, just cause you mentioned that you, so you're not only like, you've not only gone to FCD, but you've also done to art center, uh, for entertainment design <clears throat> for, I went there for two terms. It's a personal journey. Everybody has to take their own path. If you can't afford it, you can absolutely make it in this industry if you can't afford it. Like, look at some of the people out there, like like Marek Ocon mm -hmm. and Mache and all these guys. Like, they're totally self-taught. Yep. Um, this one's a, just a photo bash. Yep. Uh, Always a quick way to do weapon design because there's so many pictures of weapons out there. Lots of things to use. Oh, Absolutely. Um, this one, actually, I started learning Moto last year, so I built, I started building some stuff in Moto uh, like this. Here's a 3D model of that. Uh, this was my big, my big practice model. Like, 
I, I got to learn how to use it properly now, which I didn't. I mean, this thing's totally, the geometry is all bad, but for concept art, it's fine. Yeah, that looks solid. More Moto stuff. This one's straight out of the render, no post in Photoshop, except stitching them together. Um, yeah, this one's just a bash, no 3D or anything. And you know what I, I noticed, too, in the balance of your work, which I think is fairly worth saying because Feng Zhu just put out a video last week about it and that's like the how much design elements you actually have in your scenes like some people come at portfolios from a different perspective where they just make all these images that look really really cool I'm partially yep. I try to be partially guilty of that in some cases but your stuff <laughs> is all like really well grounded and well designed and like Feng said like not enough students are kind of approaching their portfolios from that but it seems like it has certainly served you well and made you highly employable um, I think that's partly in due by uh, a mentor that I actually got when I was in FZD. He's really a hardcore designer. Like all he does is like uh, props mm -hmm. and vehicles and all this stuff. Like his images work because they are totally designed out. Like his mechanisms work. All his stuff works really well. And he would he used to just hound me on not making my images work through you know graphic composition only but making them work by actually having an interesting idea or design behind it yeah and, and i think that comes i i made a video you know myself about two videos ago just about layering different elements to it like fang mm -hmm. reference like everyone likes to draw like those gigantic colossal sci-fi towers but it's like what do they do right who operates them what is their sense of history you know who built them what a lot of it has to go deeper than that surface level of just looking cool to have something that's really kind of tangible and that stands out. Yeah, absolutely. Like I can actually show you what they do all the time in uh, in in concept art. They do they do this. Um, they'll go stroke. Yeah, and now they'll say they'll number these one, two, three, four, five. Then they'll say, okay, now design every one of these out. Yep. And then you basically have to go in and take this doorway and you basically have to make uh, – hold on. How do I get this back? Uh, you basically have to take that doorway and make one of these. Yep. And then like, sometimes they'll want 90%. 20 of them. <laughs> exactly. Iteration. And then you'll have a week to do them and you have to have no sleep for a week. So I got what I, for those of you that don't know, I posted earlier in the day on my, the community section of the YouTube channel. I said we were going to be doing this session. You could post your questions there, and I well I also posted the same thing in the Discord a few days ago. So be sure you guys check those out if you want to participate and get your questions in for videos like this. So one of them comes. The first one here is from Bad Painter, and he asks. How useful is it to photo bash elements of an interior together in an underpainting before you finalize any details? Uh, I think that's a really good question, and I absolutely have the same question. Um, it really depends on your workflow. If you use colors from photographs, then you can absolutely do it. Mm -hmm. Like what I used to do with a bunch of stuff is – I would take a number of photographs that I really like the color of, almost like some of Fang Zhu's videos where he'd take a bunch of cool photos, like um, blur them, motion blur them underneath, and then color pick from that. Yep. Or you can even just use them to, to bash together details. And he had a second part. It says, in addition, is layering ideas for patterns and trims you've gotten from other photos a good way to figure out secondary details on top of that? Uh, absolutely. In fact, it's practically industry standard. Yeah. One of the things that I was taught to do was to take bits that I like from photos and make my own patterns out of those or re reference them. Like it's it's like it's like photo bashing 2.0. You take a I don't know a, a a tech detail from a photo. Yeah, it could be like the landing gear of like a jet, for example. Yeah, exactly. Um, and even facades of buildings and stuff, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, mixer brush, mm -hmm. uh, clone stamp, all that stuff. Anything goes. So, yeah, that was a great question. 
-hmm. Another good one, uh, in that while we're at it, what's a good way to draw visual noise, whether that's rubble, destruction, or piles of junk? And that's from Escape Pod. Um, I think the better the better question might actually be how to reduce the amount of noise that, that, and that simplify. Makes. Like, how do you imply like a, a wrecked building without getting in there and drawing, right, or, or showing photos with all that that visual detail, right? Yeah, um, I think keeping a close eye on your um, on your focal point and like let me try to find an example or something maybe like maybe in this one this one's kind of old um like how to draw like some of these buildings back here is it's it's honestly just, they're just primitives this is just a this is just a cylinder with a half sphere on top mm -hmm. and then a couple little details that read um yeah, you got to pick and choose I, your battles in regards to detail and show. You know, it, I, well, I always say it's it just as important what to show as to what not to show. Oh, exactly. And that's like a huge thing to learn. Like that's not like an easy learning curve whatsoever. And I think it's definitely like a self journey of <laughs> exploring that through raw experience. Yeah, definitely. You put in those thousands of hours, and they will take care of you. All right, so you we'll, we'll trickle in a few other questions as we go. You have the first image that you're going to break down for us, go layer by layer, and you're going to explain how you approached it. So how about I just let you go on with that, and you know I'll go along for the ride, and we'll see how it was built. Yep. So, uh, this, I mean, obviously this isn't a how to do 3D, so I'm not going to um, show you my exact process for, for building this scene in 3D, but... But I would say overall, this scene's pretty pretty straightforward. You know, it's just a uh, it's just a hallway. You know, with some these are elongated cylinders. This is a cylinder that's been bent down because I know there's probably going to be a bunch of there's always people in the comments that are just like like oh there's going to go through it, but it started so detailed. Like I want this. So was that a ZBrush model rendered yes, in I, what? Uh, man, I don't key, key shot. shot think, it looks yeah. like key shot. Yeah, it's Keyshot. Uh, Keyshot's horrible for environments, but it's all I had at that point. Um, basically, this whole thing is just primitives. Very, very much primitives. Everything's either a cylinder or cubes that have been distorted just a little bit. And the trick to fill a scene up like that is like you can repeat many, many of the same elements. Oh, yeah. This like trust right here is just copied over a bunch of time everything is just copied over a bunch of times and then i would render this so i get it's a really bad render like none of this is separated out i had to go in and manually separate all the all the like the alphas out and everything mm -hmm. and i didn't even have a very good technique to do that but so i would render it out and i actually didn't like the design before very much i thought it looked too sci-fi yep. and i didn't want it to look very sci-fi so i i edited the floor so it wasn't like 45 degree angles and stuff and oh, then yeah. did a render yeah it definitely does look a so, little less sci-fi and it's amazing that that like that, that one small detail really changed that yeah. i think it's worth noting it's like when a character yeah. designer adds a line in the wrong spot on a character's face, it can add 10 years to a character. <laughs> that just changed oh, yeah. like the whole genre. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what I did is I just made a made a hard light mm -hmm. in Keyshot and just put it off to the to the right and it made all those shadows from the windows. So even a very simple model with with you know like an array or in other words a detail copied over can create really graphic shapes mm -hmm. um would so you say from your I, experience is it a fairly common in your in your daily tasks that you could get a model like that provided uh from you from like a level designer or something and they're here make this look good you add the set dressing and the atmosphere to it I actually haven't had a lot of that, but I know it happens all the time. Yeah, that, that's my most common things. task as a as like a remote freelancer. I will get the ugliest 3D model in the world. Oh yeah, and they're It'll like, literally here, just be a bomb. make this a, a space station. Like, oh gosh, you know, and it's just like, all right. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, like most of the time you're going to get a 3D model that looks like like this. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's your 3D model. Okay, now now this is an awesome aircraft hangar. Like it make it look cool. So, you're basically starting from That's what a lot of requests it. I know from clients generally are worded. They're like, "Make it look cool." Like, okay, yeah. I'm the authority on what looks cool. Let's let's figure this out. <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of that. Um, but it's fun because that's your job. Yeah. Like, you're like, man, I get to make stuff look cool for a living. It's like that. It's like that Fang Zoo line. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I still nerd out every time I get a cool dragon to design. Or <laughs> I agree. The passion flows fun. flows thick. Yeah. Okay. So I will. Here's when I really start sketching on top. And this may seem like a huge jump for a lot of people. And let me see if I actually – I don't think I really have any – this is my only progress That's shot fine. for this stage. So basically what I did is I took a bunch uh, – my first step was I took a bunch of textures. Mm -hmm. Actually, no. My first step was I did a line work on top of – my base and you can see it's still here like a really rough sketch here's my cables here's my like different ideas for details oh, awesome. i i drew this in um and then the second thing that i did so at, at this stage was, this is still fairly early in right you're you're drawing oh yeah you're photo bashing you're you're blocking out on three you're going like all techniques like full throttle to get these design problems resolved uh, yeah, I mean, I just drew a line work on top. I masked the line work with, with this kind of greenish, like, gray color. Uh, yeah, like, brownish, I guess. And it looks kind of green because of the color palette. And then I would... So what I did was I would take brick wall textures, and I would literally just skew them into perspective mm -hmm. right here. So all this. Like, it may look a lot more detailed than it really is because the brick texture is doing all that for me at this stage like here's here's two different brick textures that i skewed in mm -hmm. and then i just put them on either like overlay or something and there's another texture of some sort of uh details or something that i skewed in right yeah because often like every little facet like every shape or surface it needs to be designed nothing can just like well i don't feel like designing that little nook in between the floor and the second level but it's like that's empty real estate that it players or people in a movie viewers are they're gonna see it and it needs to be resolved because nope. that's one thing exactly. I get most often from student work that I see is they'll just have large areas just completely neglected because they'll want to focus on something more fun like what's out the window or what the you know part of the floor looks like absolutely um, and that's an important thing. And I, I've, I've heard, I don't know if this is completely true, that really dark movies are actually a lot easier to make because you don't have to resolve anything. Yeah. They're, they're a lot cheaper because you're showing yeah. far less. Yeah. So, And I think they look great. Like, But at the same time, you have to understand that if you have a bunch of concept art in your portfolio – where only 10% of the image is, is in visible. light, the client knows you've only resolved 10% of that image. Yep. And it, it's like when a they, character designer only has characters and their like, feet or their arms, they're all kind of obscured and hidden. It's like, yeah, we, exactly. we know you can't draw your hands. <laughs> Guilty. Yep, exactly. No, I, I agree completely. So at this stage, I'm just getting in my colors. I'm just getting in my design. I think I, I actually did two steps on mm -hmm. this on this it's basically just where's my design where am i where's my cables where's that stuff and i'm getting in my base colors of the uh from the photo textures and stuff like mm -hmm. that you know using your color balance using your um it's control u i don't know what it's called uh hue saturation yeah. uh lightness thing so um on the next stage i actually remove the line work and start painting it so mm -hmm. There's that, and you can see I'm actually painting out all these characters right now um, that I had in there because I'm so I was so bad at 3D, and I am so bad at 3D that I actually have to paint these out. <laughs> like, That's why I was up 
till like midnight last night, which I'm never up that late, in Daz 3D, trying to figure out the damn render settings in that thing so I could stick a character <laughs> into my rooftop and not have it look completely botched because the, the angle and the lighting I had was just, I was never going to find a good photo reference unless I could get that of myself. But there was no, no one's available to take a picture of my, like my bare back in weird lighting yeah. at like midnight. So it, yeah, you got to be fun. resourceful. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, and as soon as that's done, your stress level goes down yes, so much. Yes, I was like, I'm sw I was sweating out the whole picture. I'm like, how do I, I got to figure out these characters. I kept putting them off and putting them off. Yeah, that's something you'll notice. I have, like, no characters in any of my pictures. Um, and funny enough, I got, I got, I always get hired on character projects. <laughs> Luck of the draw, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I, I guess it forces me to practice. It, it does. Do or die. You learn quick, and you you will see a huge prog uh, progression I, I, when you're doing character work on the job. I, that, that's my first stuff was laughably bad, but like three years later, it was actually showable. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Lots of bad. Lots of bad images. Um. So just more details. Uh, adding in some of my drawing stuff uh decided to add like a little board i don't really necessarily like it that much but i kind of added this kind of horizontal shape right here mm -hmm. or not horizontal but diagonal yeah really cool so it, it certainly feels um, lived in yeah uh i think that was actually another question yeah um i don't know where that is i'm looking i, I saw that someone asked about how how to make a place look lived in i don't remember who it was yeah, that. Let me see. You you can keep going, and I'll look for that. Okay. So um, here is one. I added these cables on the top left. I feel like it kind of needed more. I don't know. I felt like it needed maybe a little bit more symmetry as far as the cables on the roof went. Mm -hmm. And I mean, where where was that layer? Okay, yeah. And then I darkened up some foreground, midground. In a room like this, it's really difficult to get your depths because it's so such short of a distance. Mm -hmm. So you need to really exaggerate the fog. You need to really exaggerate. Just exaggerate everything. Like, it, 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 like you can see that this looks a lot more flat yeah. than this. Yeah. Read readability has to be a priority. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was Transcendental uh, Raccoon asked, how do you make interiors feel lived in? Okay, yeah. Uh, reference absolutely reference uh make stories like who built this why did they build it what power mm -hmm. is it what all this stuff like i imagine like these lights right here make it feel like it's on these lights right here might power up like do 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 do, do and then it's like on yeah. um generator for power um cables dirt where does the dirt get kicked when people walk yep. through where does it, like where does it pile up if you're doing a bedroom like like go and look at your bedroom does it look lived in i'm, I'm sure most people's bedrooms look very lived in yep uh i got jackets all over the floor i got a backpack a empty garbage bag that i was going to use to put garbage <laughs> things in. things tend to like, a pile up in corners of or in against corners walls. exactly <laughs> Where the walkways, sometimes you have to spread everything apart so you can walk through the room. That gives a specific look, too. If you've ever been hiking, um, deer and elk and different animals make trails through the grass, and they use them. Mm -hmm. That's all lived in. So, let's see. I got... Uh, this is a shadow for some plants that I'm adding in, so... Okay, you yeah. You see, I put a shadow underneath, and then I just put this in. Um, this is literally just uh, like a photo texture from something like like here and there you can see that it's actually like a stock photo <laughs> that I like removed the stuff yeah, from stamping you can see there's like cut lines and stuff but it doesn't really matter because it reads from a distance that's all I'm looking for um, more shadows more plants right here yeah. Uh, so this is kind of my detail phase. My whole image is kind of set up where I want it from a distance yep. to a to a reasonable level. And then I'm like, okay, I feel comfortable with where I am in this image. Now I'm just going to be adding details. And here's a detail layer uh, right here. Like I'll add stuff, like start rendering out some of my boards a little bit, adding lighting, adding um, stuff. Uh, I decided to add a dog to it. Just because life. He's hanging out. 
Yeah, doggo. People like things that they can see and just instantly relate to. Exactly, and and it also gives scale because you don't really know exactly how I big noticed... this is. Like maybe tire could give scale, but tires come in so many different sizes. I noticed that yep. uh, you added uh, context to where this room is located by establishing that it's a kind of in a high rise. Like you can just barely see the tops of many buildings out those windows. Yeah. Was that a decision you made from the get go or is that something you kind of layered in after the fact? Uh, I think I actually did make that decision from the get go. Um, just because I didn't really want it underground. Like I, I try to find as many opportunities as I can to add a little bit more maybe uniqueness to my, to my designs. Mm -hmm. Maybe something that you haven't seen a, a whole bunch of times, and I'm certainly not the best at it, but just different stuff that everybody's already done that maybe you could interpret a little bit of a different way. Yeah. And I think taking the care to think of, like, how can I add my own spin to this prevents, you know, your work from getting too stale. And it also is a lot of people, like, do her, as Fang says, doing concepts of other concept artwork. So eventually everything's just a certain derivative. But when you can really get in there and add your own take to things, you can find, you know, your own unique voice, uh, you know, to them and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy, like... Like, I don't think a bunch of students realize how easy it is for a professional who's been working to immediately detect if someone's just doing, you know, The Last of Us fan art mm -hmm. or if they're actually designing their own stuff. Like, I can look at portfolios, and sometimes these portfolios can have thousands of followers, like on ArtStation and, you know, 10,000 followers on Instagram, whatever, and... I look at their work and I'm just like, I know for a fact this pro this person has trouble finding client work. Yeah, I, I don't know. I wanted to go really detailed with this. Um, I think I was actually, I think this was actually in a class that I was doing in Art Center, but I went like completely off spec and I think I think I wanted to try to do a good enough job that they won't get mad at me for it. Like, can I pull it off? Because this was definitely not what they asked for and I kind of just felt like doing an environment. So do they get more uh, So for like that particular class, did they get fairly specific as you said like they'll provide you with like a mock-up brief and they want to see how many students like take a crack at it with a certain amount of accuracy or um yeah, I think this was a, a, a an assignment called a crystal room assignment, so we basically that was basically it. Like they basically had a a, a top view of a couple squares and they're just like this is kind of what your room is going to look like. And any theme, any context, just make sure that there's crystal and so, like we we're supposed to add more animals and or or add more stuff that I didn't because I was didn't feel like doing it. <laughs> I'm a bad example. Uh, I don't know what that layer does. Plants, more plants. Uh, and then I, I'd usually add like color dodge or something to light these. Um, I use color dodge all the time to light stuff. Like all the time. Is it a guilty pleasure it. at this point for you? Kind of. <laughs> I mean, if you know how to control your your values and your um, saturations, especially because color dodge is like exponential growth to light, and real lighting is not exponential growth. If you know how to control it, then you must tame. That's you must tame the beast. Yeah, exactly. So, but like I use color dodge all the time for lighting because it's on like a separate layer and you can clip it and all this stuff. It's great. So this is actually a shadow for a cloth that I added and it adds a little bit more uh, kind of man-made feel and a uh, red for the focal point because there's not much red anywhere else. Maybe a little bit in the plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely sticks out. Uh, I spray painted an X on the cloth. So you're Jeez. layering human touches two human touches at every possible opportunity yep absolutely it's like when you see uh, like a character designer and i like to keep making parallels because all kinds of people watch these videos like when you if, if it's something doesn't look like it's ever been worn before if it doesn't have any kind of branding on it everything looks brand new and it's like unidentifiable it's like a, just like a common problem yeah definitely just making it feel real so important yeah 
But like you'll notice that like with that question earlier about the about the details, like you'll notice that this plant right here is basically just a silhouette. <laughs> like there's no details until you get into some of the part that's that has light hitting yep. it. Like you wanna really control your amount of detail. Like even in a piece that has photo bash, like there's really subtle there's really subtle places that don't have very that have very little detail or that have one flat texture that's like across it. Very important. So I have another question and I, I think it's it's yep. been partially covered already, but and or I, I think it's been fairly obvious at this point, but how important is 3D for your workflow and do you bake out your render passes? Uh, uh I don't need it. And like, that's from Keith. I enjoy using it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's a good, really good question. Um, what is he, uh, every what is he, in case somebody doesn't know, what does baking out your render passes essentially mean? Oh, man. Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I have very little skill with 3D. Um, anything I lack in 3D, I make up for in 2D. Yeah. Like, this S entire image me. is basically made by... 2d like the 3d that you see in the very beginning is absolutely not necessary for me to make this image it lit it just makes a perspective easier yeah. um baking i'll probably tell you the wrong thing and everybody will laugh at me so i don't actually know exactly then, i think it has the then it's probably fair to say like you don't use it or feel that it's necessary no, right. I mean, there's no doubt 3D makes your work look a lot better, but is it absolutely necessary? Yeah, it, it, no. it saves you time at the end of the day in most cases. Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. What is this? I don't even know what I did here. Oh, just a little cleanup stuff. Clean up. Uh, object texture. Oh, yeah, here's when, I, uh, here's when I started detailing out this. So uh, this was, like, just a drawing at this yep. point. Now I'm, I bashed together a couple different tech details uh -huh. put it on there and i i hate the design of this like i would absolutely redesign this thing i'd spend some time making different thumbnails mm -hmm. and all that but so fog on top of it uh more fog a little bit i can actually merge those layers there uh more plant stuff this one's called down at the bottom left it's, it's certainly an awesome take on like a, a sunroom, a high rise sunroom with all this tech and <laughs> stuff in it. Yeah, that's. Uh, I had a lot of fun making this. I don't know what this layer was. I think I'm starting to make some change, some bigger changes in these next couple layers to. So this, I wanted the uh, the read of stuff to be a little bit better, like the background, the graphic shape. So I went ahead and used that. Uh, I generally make was... those sort of decisions too. There, and I always because I talk about that a lot. And I think just to clear it up that there might be a slight misconception on that. It's like that is not a be all end all, and it, it doesn't have to be that way. And it's a hundred percent a personal preference. Some people love going for more subtle, subdued lighting, but you know sometimes, <laughs> like myself, I love to pop certain shapes in and out of places. Oh yeah, and in a more and, obvious and way. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah, and. An image doesn't need it. Like, there's no correct way to do an image. Yeah. There's just interpretation. Like, a different artist would take a completely different approach to this room, and it would still be correct. Uh, let's see. So oh, here's a big yeah that that helps big, it a lot. So yeah, this is like when I realized, oh my gosh, this image is actually terrible. I need to do some big fixes to it, and then that helps bring the focal point in um i love this just turning that layer on and off it's amazing like how even like late into an image like when you can get a fresh look on something like that and you realize you know i i got it this far but what's it really going to require for me to get it to the next level and it, sometimes Absolutely. it can be something drastic like that yep yeah. a couple details uh, here's a very subtle color change, if you can see it. Uh, you might not be able to. Off. <laughs> on. Oh, off. yeah, that is extremely subtle. I think I actually like the blue version better, but I'll leave it on for now. Uh, oh, this one's called a little color dodge, so... <laughs> Let's see. Boom. Yeah, there is a little color dodge. I like that. 
Yeah, blow that light out a bit. Here's another little color dodge. <laughs> uh, and just the difference that this makes is actually pretty pretty yeah. big. Uh, but careful with color dodge. You gotta be careful. And then see this what I'm doing right here is this actually a saturation layer because I think the color dodge got a little bit too saturated so I'm bringing it back. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually don't keep that. I usually do that within the color dodge layer. Small details on crystal. Yeah, there's just a couple little details that I did on here. Nice. I hope that's a really sweet time machine that harnesses those crystals to power it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have no idea what I was designing. Yeah. Sometimes it's fun that uh, way. Yeah, a little bit of, tiny bit of rendering. Details. Uh, here's a bunch of just different details. I fixed the perspective on this board because mm -hmm. it was off. And then just some, some various stuff like that. Um, this is like the, you're really lucky that you asked about this room uh, for the, for like the whole interview thing because this is one of the only images that a lot of the layers are still intact. <laughs> So this is a color lookup. Yep. Color lookup is a really cool, really cool filter. Uh, you go down to here, and then you go to these different like filters. There's like I all these seen different. This before. Like that's cool. Color lookup is awesome. I had a teacher in an art center. Such a cool guy. His name was Sean Hargreaves. Mm -hmm. He's like a big, big. Uh, Hollywood. So is that like an adjustment on a layer? This is like a filter that goes okay. on top of everything. And how do people find you can this? Flip it to layer. Uh, it's down at the bottom in I don't know what it's this a circle. is like a little half built-in circle. Okay. And then you go your third box down is color lookup. Oh, I never noticed that before. I. did not. I've been either, using Photoshop so for like more than half my life, and I've never noticed. Yeah. You never know but when these you aren't set in stone. <laughs> like these are not set in stone. Like you may look at yeah. one of these and you may be like, "I am never going to use that." But what you realize is that you could put it at you know twenty percent opacity, and it really it can if used right. Because uh, I use similar things, but not not in color lookup. But like you can harmonize an image in regards to the lighting yeah. and the color palette like this. Yep, exactly. You can change the fill the settings mm -hmm. on it. The different stuff yep. like make some really cool looking stuff but there's a couple of them that i like foggy night is really cool and then uh just all kinds of stuff i can yeah that's sweet uh let's see just drag that to the garbage so yeah i just did a really subtle effect changing the colors um i don't know what's on this next layer mystery Oh, it's another hue layer. I, I changed the val the saturation of something, or the color. Oh yeah, here it is. It's right here. Um, and then my masks are actually on top. So I masked out all the windows so I could select it quickly. Mm -hmm. So I could just you know click on that control uh, click on the uh, little window right yep. here, and it'll select all my windows. Definitely a time and then saver. The, the Fang Zhu technique of your, your value check layer. Yep. Uh, if anybody does not know how to do this, you basically make a new layer, fill it with completely black, and then you change the layer setting to hue or saturation or color, mm -hmm. and it turns your image black and white. Oh. Very helpful. And... Yeah, that's the whole image. That's Thank everything. Thank you for walking us through that today. Yeah, I hope I didn't. No, go I'm sure that I think I'm sure we must have answered a lot of people's questions, even if they didn't have time to submit. So, guys, if you have any questions for either of us, I just leave them in the comments. We're also taking uh, suggestions on uh, future episodes, and I hope you all have a great week. Uh, take care.